Salaam Alaikum. Good afternoon. My name is Ravi Mamtani. I work as a faculty member at Weill Cornell Medical College uh, in Qatar. I am delighted to welcome you to a newly established series uh, entitled Population Health and Wellbeing Series. <clears throat> Before we get into the objectives um, and, and the talk, I'd like to remind us of some housekeeping notes. Um, one, your cameras and microphones are turned off. Um, I would request that you use the Q&A feature to type your questions and or comments that you might have. Uh, questions will be addressed at the end of the session and they will be coordinated by Dr. Suhela Chima. <clears throat> Um, as a reminder, this activity is approved by the Qatar Council of Healthcare Practitioners and also by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education in the US. <clears throat> uh, as a reminder, in order for you to receive credit, you must follow the steps. And these steps include, number one, the post-activity evaluation will be available in your cloud CME account by October 25th. You will receive an email notification once the evaluation is available in your cloud CME account. And number three, your certificates will be available for download once you complete the post activity evaluation on the cloud CME portal. <clears throat> now, just maybe a minute or two on why we got into population health and well being series. The most people, this is a topic that has been discussed at length in many of our sessions and from times immemorial. It's public health, it's population health. <clears throat> so this was something that appeared in New York Times in, in April of 2020, as recent as April 9, 2020, as I said. It was an opinion piece and talked about the experience that Americans have had in the US. And the title of the article was The US Approach to Public Health Characterized by Neglect and Panic. And if you have an opportunity when you read it, the summation, probably a conclusion is that a strong public health system is the best guarantor of good health. And I thought that was an eye opener for most of us and we had an opportunity to look at it. And when we in IPH got and, and tried to dig out information on population health and public health, it became clear and apparent then in recent months, especially since COVID-19, that there are many challenges that the world is facing. Many countries are encountering these challenges. <clears throat> and just to name a few here, clearly there is a lot of literature to support that there is inadequate public health education in professional health schools. And there are references to support that statement. Number two, inadequate funding for public health systems. And as an example, America spends only 2.5% of its health budget on public health programs. And again, there was a write-up in New York Times in 2019, also a wonderful report generated by Trust for America's Health. And then in other readings, clearly it became more apparent that there is in general less emphasis on essential elements of healthcare and public health and lifestyle medicine, equity, disease prevention as, as cases in point. <clears throat> you know, and this also gives you an opportunity to reflect. You wonder what's going on in the world. Clearly COVID-19 was what? It also, you begin to look for identity, you look to, to see if there are windows of opportunities and also look for success stories in these difficult times. And clearly we came across some things, for example, during COVID-19, we know and are aware that people are beginning to rely on healthy home cooked meals. That's wonderful. Also, I should point out that when you look at the mortality data from COVID-19, Qatar and Singapore have done extremely well. They've had the lowest mortality rates that have been seen in the world. And for example, if you look at the picture, this is as of this morning, Qatar has experienced only 224, I'm using the word only 224 as compared to thousands of deaths in other nations. So obviously when you look at all of this, it becomes clear 
that, that there is something that we thought we could do at Wild Cornell Medical College in Qatar, whereby we could provide a platform for exchange of information on contemporary population health and public health topics. Our focus at the Institute for Population Health in Qatar is about people in Qatar, their health and their well-being. And that's when our series took birth. We called it Population Health and Wellbeing Series, which was approved, as I said, by Qatar Council of Healthcare Practitioners. And we stated in our submission that we will fulfill three objectives. Number one, in the series, we will discuss contemporary and critical topics relevant to healthcare, medicine, and population health. Number two, we will examine evidence-based practices germane to public health and patient care. And number three, we will describe opportunities and challenges in the evolving face of healthcare and population health. <clears throat> so here we go. This is our inaugural seminar and we, we have entitled it Life in Transition, as we said in these difficult times, thriving during the pandemic and, and beyond. And to present that complex topic in these difficult times, we have a very esteemed and a distinguished speaker in our Dean, Dean Javed Sheikh, who is also a professor of psychiatry and professor of population health research at Wild Cornell Medical College in New York. So with that, I want to take a couple of minutes to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Sheikh. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dean Javed Sheikh for today's inaugural webinar in a newly established population health series program. For those of you who know Dr. Sheikh, Dr. Sheikh is, an, and I will mention this, is an internationally renowned medical executive and a creative thought leader in global, and global medicine and, and health care. As a Dean of Wild Cornell Medical College in Qatar, Dr. Sheikh has pioneered innovative biomedical educational research program, programs, establishing the college as a leading institution, preparing global physicians for the 21st century. And at the same time, if I may say, supporting the educational interests of all healthcare professionals in Qatar and beyond. His groundbreaking approaches in the development of population health programs have been admirable. Sahatak Awalan, your Health First, an innovative public health program that promotes healthy lifestyles is a case in point. Dr. Sheikh co-founded Innovations in Health, Global Health Profession Education Program, and also serves on the Artificial Intelligence Forum of the National Academy of Medicine in the United States. Previously, Dr. Sheikh served as a professor and associate dean at Stanford University School of Medicine in California. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dean Sheikh to the virtual podium. Dr. Sheikh, over to you, please. Thank you, Dr. Mzani. Thank you for very generous remarks. It's truly a pleasure to be here uh, at this inaugural forum. I think it's very timely. Uh, what the world is going through is really unprecedented. The last 100 years, we haven't had anything like this. We have learned the lessons and you showed some of the graphics. It's very unfortunate uh, what has happened in the US, but hopefully we learn our lessons. What I want to do today really is to pivot the topic from, yes, the sobering picture to how we can thrive during this pandemic and also beyond that, what is going to be the new normal. So I'm going to pivot toward a positive mindset while definitely addressing the real issues which are we all of us have to address. So let me with that, let me get started. And those of you in attendance, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you for taking time from your very busy schedules. And uh, I am really excited to share with you what I think about some of these issues. Uh, and uh, it, it will be very much a dialogue. So I will speak for between 35 to 40 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. So with that, let me get going. Let me see if I can share my screen here. OK, 
Can everyone see this, the whole page screen? Yes, Dr. Sheikh. Okay, thank you so much. So this is my disclosure statement. Now I'm quoting Isaac Asimov, who is a, you know, was basically just about the most renowned uh, science fiction writer of 20th century, wrote, I think more than 200 novels, but they were all science fiction. So uh, this quote is, life is pleasant in general, uh, with of course a few times like the one we are passing through, death is peaceful, it's a transition that is troublesome. And I'll talk about the transition and how to prepare for the transition to the new normal and how to really thrive when we get there. So the objectives are, there are three objectives. First is to recognize that self-care toward physical and emotional well-being and building resilience are the cornerstones for functioning well during this pandemic. I mean, this is rather self-evident, but uh, I will touch on it briefly. And then go on to the second objective, which is to go beyond the resilience and identify the important roles of a clear life purpose, a daily practice to create healthy lifestyle and social connectedness to get a sense of proportion during these unprecedented times and to function at a high level. And the third one is to examine how one can systematically use mind tools and strategies and technology to achieve and then maintain peak functioning in the new normal beyond this pandemic. So with that, let me first, uh, the first part of this presentation will be a few slides, which is really to set the stage. So this is providing the context. And then the other three parts of the presentation will follow. So these are the various scenarios of the course of COVID-19 pandemic, which are being talked about. But uh, first one is really for comparison's sake, uh, I will be, sh I'm showing you the, what happened during Spanish influenza panic. You can see the initial outbreak then a few months, kind of a low level continuation, and then a major peak after a few months. We do not know, of course, what's going to happen here, but there are three different scenarios which I want to share with you quickly. First one is possible waves and peaks and valleys, and I'll come back and I'll share with you what I think where maybe uh, each of these three scenarios apply to different countries. And the second scenario is after the first outbreak, a few months later, we have a fall peak. And the third one is a slow burn. So let's get to scenario one. I mean, peaks and valleys, it appears at this time that Europe, many countries in Europe are going through these things. So they are outbreaks, and then there is uh, you know, containment, and then another outbreak, and then they, they, some of them are up to their third outbreak. U.S. unfortunately is where it's the beginning of the fall uh, peak and uh, it's actually right on time, say unfortunately, but it's going there and it's getting there and looks like all predictions from the experts are the next six to eight weeks are going to be very difficult. Qatar fortunately after having its first peak is on what appears to be a slow burn and hopefully over the next few months we can then extinguish that slow burn. So with that, let me first share with you the first question uh, before I get to the main uh, substance of my presentation. Which is the biggest risk for anxiety, depression? Let's stay there, sorry. It's, uh, I think, went back. Okay. Here. So which is the biggest risk for anxiety or depression during the pandemic? Number one, social isolation. Number two, fear of illness. Number three, finances. Number four, someone in the family getting COVID-19. So I'll wait for a few seconds before we move on to the presentation. So people have a chance to look at the questions and then record their answers. Okay, let's move on. There is unfortunately, I mean, there's epidemic, of course, COVID-19, but there is really an epidemic within the epidemic of mental health problems. CDC has been reporting increased levels of anxiety and depression, particularly in younger adults. 
Mental Health Association, these are from US, reporting major increase more than three times anxiety and depression. And it appears that loneliness and social isolation has been a major factor in this. Preliminary data uh, you know, published in JAMA earlier this year from China. Again, it appears that symptoms of depression, anxiety are quite common in almost half of the patients, insomnia in about one third, not patients, I'm sorry. This is, these are healthcare professionals. And in New York, our own study at the bottom, it appears that uh, this was a couple of months ago, ongoing study, 1685 healthcare workers at Weill Cornell in New York suggests 40 to 50% rates of moderate to severe anxiety or depression. Again, very high rates. And over there also social isolation seems to be the biggest factor influencing mental health compared to family close friends being infected and their finances, which is remarkable. So that brings me to the question and let's see how people answered when that question was asked, which is the biggest. All right, social isolation, actually fear of illness uh, seem to be right there with social isolation. So people are very close. It really seemed to be in at least those two studies, social isolation seemed to be the highest feared factor in terms of and a, a biggest risk for creating anxiety or depression. Let's move on to the substance of presentation now. Objective one, building a foundation for wellness developing resilience. So as I said earlier, we all know we are in the middle of a pandemic and yes, we have to develop resilience. And the second objective would be to go beyond resilience. And the third would be to really go to peak function, just to remind them. So let's talk about building resilience. Before that, we have our question, which of the following statements about resilience is not correct, not correct, one of them. Accepting change as part of life facilitates resilience. Resilience can be learned by anyone. People can have personalized ways of developing resilience. Resilience is innate and the person is born with it. Keeping things in perspective can help build resilience. So out of these five multiple choice questions, you have to choose one which you think is not correct. I'll wait for about 20 seconds. Okay, so let's move on. So what is resilience? It is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, significant sources of stress such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, workplace and financial stresses. It really means bouncing back from difficult experience. That's a copybook foundation from American Psychological Association's website. The most important thing in this is many, many, many times one has to develop resilience when there are chronic stressors going on in life, like these days. Where were we talk about resilience, there really is a talk of stress, stressors. And so to fully understand resilience, one has to look at the stress pathways to really conceptualize how does one go about developing resilience. It's a complicated picture. I only want you to know that human body is marvelous in its response to acute stress, the fight or flight response just pay attention to the three structures up there in the brain, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and pituitary gland. Amygdala, right fight or flight reaction, and it all systems go whenever there's any kind of threat and hypothalamus and sends out signals to pituitary to then start discharging different kinds of hormones and also basically targeting certain organs like adrenal medulla, which then uh, uh, discharges norepinephrine and epinephrine. So I would not go more in detail, but I, what I'm saying is that human organism is marvelously adapted for acute stress. Unfortunately, it is not as well adapted for chronic stress. So modern life, other than you know, driving on the freeways here, that like happened to me this morning, or driving, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in the 
in a good mood listening to nice music and I just look in the rear view mirror and there is an SUV almost basically mowing me down uh, out of nowhere. And I could not get anywhere because there's a car in front of me and the guy gave up on me and then turned second lane and then the third lane, I couldn't get anywhere, then came back all the way behind me and in between, so that is stressful. But in general, in modern life, those kind of things are, don't happen very frequently. It is really the chronic stress. Unfortunately, our system is not geared for chronic stress. So what happens is multiple stressors, small stressors accumulate over a period of time and your very well-honed system of acute stress response starts failing. And that's where the stress comes in. In fact, WHO said this statement was uh, in the first half of the century, actually first uh, decade of the century, even long before the pandemic started. The stress is a global health epidemic of the 21st century. So why? Well, it's because they are rapidly changing societies, rapidly changing norms due to globalization. There's breakdown of traditional family structure. There's increased urbanization everywhere, long commutes, constant time pressure, lack of long-term job security because the companies are starting and failing very quickly. It's not how it used to be. You just work with one company from the beginning to the end, from General Motors or Orizo here. It's just, or, you know, uh, Qatar Petroleum. It, increasingly, that is not the case. There's also increasing expectations of efficiency and quick response for peers and boss to stay in touch, constant email and WhatsApp. And there's limited time for self-care. So there is a lot of chronic stress, which is really giving rise to all kinds of stress-related illnesses and problems. And that's where the resilience really needs to come in. We need to prevent stress from creating dysfunction. So what is the conceptual framework behind building resilience? A good way really is to not view it as an innate trait that only a few fortunate people possess, but a set of cognitions, actions, and behaviors that can be learned and improved with practice by most people. This is the biopsychosocial model. All of us are biological organisms. We have our psychology. And there is, of course, a whole environment, social environment that we live in. So I will simplify it. This is basically the genes interact with environment. You can see in the top, which includes camp, family and community support resources. And they act to create certain kind of gene expression, which really creates certain kinds of new neuronal circuitry early in life, which hopefully, if it is healthy, balances the threat reward responses, emotional regulation, cognitive control. But at times, we are either they are stressors early in life, or they are certain vulnerable genes, the stress response and the adaptability may not be as good. Now, later in life, the psychological factors of efficacy or optimism and cognitive reappraisal actually can bring back some of the dysfunction toward functionality. And I'll get to that uh, by sharing some of these strategies and techniques and, and tactics. We can use some of those techniques to prevent. And in fact, they can be used for therapeutic interventions also when the stress is there. But more importantly, we're talking about preventing stress and or, or dysfunctional stress response and creating resilience. There is genetics and genomics of resilience. I will quickly go through these things. I mean, they are longitudinal studies, one or two, not a whole lot. And it does appear there is some genetic inheritance, but not a whole lot. There are some gene variants which increase sensitivity to environment, but really is the picture is not as robust. There are neuroimaging studies also, which do suggest that higher activity of amygdala, which is really the uh, center in the brain, fear center, higher activity uh, gives rise to those people who do tend to be more prone to developing stress response. And flip side of that is that in the prefrontal cortex regions, if it's hypoactive, there's a low reactivity of amygdala also. This is one of the studies from Yale. It came a while back, about five, six years ago, which did show that those uh, patients, those people, those subjects who 
showed a flexible neural response to threatening stimuli in the prefrontal cortex, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex during sustained stress exposure, they were much better suited dealing with stress and they were more resilient. There are some resilience enhancing biological interventions also being tested. I'll quickly go through them because they are very preliminary in animals mostly. And the results are what I would say are very mixed at this time. So uh, I think it'll take another decade, maybe a two before the magic pill disappears. And I'm a skeptic. I think a human uh, brains are very complex organs, multifactorial. So we'll have to bring all strategies together to really impact and more importantly, we have to create resilience for which we already have cognitive strategies present. So what are those cognitive strategies? Well, these are the cognitive strategies. If you start from the bottom on the left-hand side, making connections, social connections with other people, avoiding seeing crises as insurmountable problems. I mean, these are very commonsensical things, but I can tell you, if you act on these principles, they do work over a period of time. Accepting that change is part of living, moving towards your goals, taking decisive actions, looking for opportunities for self-discovery, nurturing a positive view of oneself, keeping things in perspective, maintaining a hopeful outlook, and identifying the other ways one can work well and create one's own personal strategy. As we go further, I'll go beyond these strategies to very specific actions and daily practices and what we call tactics or daily practice as to how to implement them to create resilience. But before we get to that, we need to, again, look at how people responded to the question that we showed earlier, which of the following statements about resilience is not correct. So this time, people, most people got it. The majority got it. The, the resilience is innate and the person is born with it is not correct. Resilience can be learned by almost anyone with practice in a very systematic fashion. Okay, now we are going to go to the second part of the presentation, which will be really going mm -hmm. beyond resilience. So beyond resilience, having a clear life purpose and establishing daily practice for a healthy lifestyle. But before that, we will again ask questions. So, which of the following statements about daily practice for a healthy lifestyle is false, false? Which of the following five statements? This picture of the polls comes in the middle, so you can move it to the left of your screen to see clearly what the questions are. So question number one is, which of the following statements about daily practice for a healthy lifestyle is false? Number one is learning something new. Two, regular exercise, three, practicing relaxation, meditation, prayers, four, sleeping no more than six hours, and five, a balanced diet. Which of them is false? I'll wait for about 20 seconds before moving on. Okay, let's move on. So let's start with the clear life purpose. A central component of optimal functioning is truly a clear life purpose. Well, what is clear life purpose? Clear life purpose is very individualized. Everyone needs to determine for themselves. What do I want to do in my life? What do I want to achieve? Career-wise, personally, with the family, for the world, you want to cure cancer, you want to end poverty, you want to have a loving family, you want to have a successful career, any of those, but it needs to be very clear in the head of the individual. No, it does not come overnight, but you really need to spend some time thinking about it because study after study suggests those people who have a clear mindset about the, their purpose in life, you agree, might agree or disagree with their life purpose, it does not matter. If they are clear in their own heads about clear life purpose, that gives rise to very successful aging and very successful life, uh, longer lifespan and healthier lifespan. The life purpose needs to be personally meaningful. It needs to involve productive engagement with the world, rest of the world, whether it's the whole world or your family or your, your peers. 
systems, your country, howsoever you want to do it. It needs to foster optimism and hope. You are feeling like you are contributing in a meaningful fashion, and it leads to life satisfaction, very positive social relationships. So that's absolutely essential. Again, it seems to be obvious, but many times we forget about it. Daily practice. So what is the daily practice? Now, I am a big believer in daily practice. You know, uh, throughout life, one learns about exercise is good or balanced diet is good or sleep is good. Or, of course, prayers or meditation are good. I think unless you have a very clearly defined daily practice from the time that you wake up to the time you sleep, you will not go, not only you will not develop very strong resilience, but you will not go beyond that to really toward your peak function. So along those lines, my suggestion is to think from the time that you wake up, whether it is your prayers or you want to do a little bit of relaxation, meditation or music, however you want to start your morning, you need to you know, exchange some messages if you want to on your WhatsApp, if that's what your forte, I don't, I starting after my initial things, I do the regular exercise, but you can start how, so you want to do that. I'm just going from left to right, or maybe I can share with you what I do. So it's after the prayers, meditation, relaxation, I do the brief exercise, go for a walk for half an hour. It is early in the morning. Try to have balanced diet, which means uh, slow carbs. I wouldn't say no carbs, but slow carbs. Uh, cut out the refined carbs, the sugars, and the breads, and the pastas, if as much as you can. A good night's sleep, absolutely essential because that really makes the day. And then you can go to the left side of the circle of breaking monotony with enjoyable hobbies, learning something new always, whether it's reading a new book or making new friends or finding a new restaurant or finding a new activity. It doesn't matter. Whatever you, periodic exposure to novel situations along the same lines, and then the rest is there. So this is what I would call daily practice. This is very close to what my daily practice is, and it really makes a difference. When I compare from years ago when I did not used to have a regular daily practice, I think it's, I have a hard time believing that people can develop resilience and be at a very high level functioning without having a very regular daily practice. We are creatures of habit. And as I go further, I'll share with you the brain plasticity when I get to that section those habits really make changes in the brain. So don't discount them. They make a very big difference. Doing it once, doing it twice, doing it three times, doing it frequently, then it becomes a habit, then it's hard to break and you are getting all the benefits. And then I want to say something about social connectedness before we get to our question. Social connectedness is absolutely essential. There's a vast body of literature of the last 50 years suggesting strongly social connection is essential for us. We are social animals for our health, for our survival. These go all the way back 50 years, really. And many, many of them also indicate that positively perceived social connections are associated with subjective well-being, good physical and mental health indicators. So now that I've shared with you daily practice and conceptual framework of the overall developing resilience, we go back, actually, sorry, one last slide before I get to the question, beyond resilience. So it, it's really a summary of the section, a deep purpose of life, caring and gratitude are key components of a fulfilled life. Gratitude again and again and again has been shown to create a big difference in people and caring for others. Altruism actually is a very healthy thing. I know, unfortunately, in the last 100 years or so, we have gotten into the habit and the culture has gone very much toward more self-centeredness and less of altruism. But you can see some of the impact of that in modern life, the stress. Uh, my own country, uh, US, is the poster child for that these days. Uh, enthusiasm for self-discovery, growth and self-efficacy. Altruism, bonding, teamwork, social connectedness. I already talked to you about that. Keeping things in perspective with a sense of proportion. It really, you see people who are more balanced and don't overreact in general, being happier. Optimism, learned hopefulness and helpfulness. This might sound like a superficial positive psychology. Actually, it is not. Study after study 
suggests that people with a more positive outlook do better, actually. As I say, the old saying in uh, high school and college was, fake it till you make it, or fake hopefulness and helpfulness and optimism initially till you get used to it. Your brain will get used to it. And establish daily practice, as I said earlier, absolutely essential. So getting to our question for this section, which of the following statements about daily practice? So let's see what people say. Ah, they, people seem to be big fans of sleep here. I am with you. You really need to sleep as much as you can, but I would say in general, if you can get seven to eight hours of sleep, that's fantastic. Seven hours is pretty good. Less than that is a problem. Let's get to our next section. Last objective, objective three, is cognitive strategies and technology for peak functioning in the transition to new normal. The new normal we are talking about, everyone is saying that the world is going to change. The same pandemic is going to go on for a year, year and a half. Most conservative estimates are that at least 2021 is going to be one of those in the slow burn or peak and valleys, but pretty much life would not be back to normal as it used to be, but it would be a new norm. So during that time, we need to come up with cognitive strategies, which can make us function better, thrive, not only during the new normal, but beyond that. But before that, of course, our question. So which of the following statements is correct? Number one, neurons that fire together, wire together. I'll repeat that. Neurons that fire together, that discharge together, wire together. Basically, they are in the proximity and they are connected. Number two, it is not possible to form new neuronal connections after the age of 40. Number three, exponential technologies will replace human functions completely by 2050. Number four, intelligence and talents are innate gifts. Number five, social connections via technology are better than in-person connections. I can tell you this thing, one thing. Uh, no, right, social connections, sorry, number five, social connections via technology are better than in-person connections. So I'll wait for 20 seconds before we move on to the present, substance of presentation of this section. So one of these five is correct, or is definitely correct. Others might come close, but are not correct. I'll give another 10 seconds. It's a little bit more difficult question, I think. Okay, well, let's move to the next one. So cognitive strategies for peak functioning, they are based on new findings of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, as I'll define in the next slide, really is a broad umbrella in terms of the overall flexibility of the nervous system to adapt to to develop new connections and learn actually new materials, even in adults. So strategies based on new findings of neuroplasticity and number two, adhering to a growth mindset, creating the flow, use it or lose it, and brain training apps. So these are five cognitive strategies amongst many, amongst hundreds, which are out there for peak functioning but I'm putting them in these headings because underneath each of them are multiple tactics. So neuroplasticity, as I said, is a general umbrella term, usually refers to brain's complex and multifaceted ability to change, adapt and modify both structure and function throughout life. This can be a result of or in response to development. Usually the first 25 years of age is where most of the brain development takes place. And uh, for hundreds of years, it really used to be thought that for sure in midlife, you cannot change anything in the brain. Basically you are stuck with whatever you have. It turns out that actually it's not the case. Again and again and again, we have learned that one can learn. Yes, the English rude way of saying uh, in English language, oh, 
you, the old dogs can't uh, learn new tricks. Uh, basically, uh, I would say a little bit more politely that yes, uh, more mature adults like myself can definitely learn new tricks. So uh, basically neuroplasticity can be in response to development as I said earlier and experience. Trauma and adaptation, many, many studies have shown now, even uh, the split brain studies, that the brains develop and adapt to whatever is taken away from them. New connections, stronger connections. Same thing with pathologic processes and compensatory rewriting. Degenerative diseases, many of them, the onset can be delayed or even prevented with brain training exercise. The cognitive impairment, which used to be really almost indispensable after the age of 70 or so is no longer true. Growth mindset. So this is uh, from Carol Dweck at Stanford. I mean, she actually, is, maybe 30, 35 years ago, started doing studies with young kids, elementary school kids. And uh, what she learned was that really it seemed to be general misunderstanding of what works and what does not work. Uh, as many of us, we grew up with this that some kids are bright and others are just not. And what she uh, came up with theory and then tested it over the last 30 years and again and again demonstrated that actually there is something different called growth mindset as opposed to the rigid mindset or fixed mindset, which says that people are born smart. The Mozarts of the world basically uh, are geniuses and that's how they're created. And when you look at the uh, life story of Mozart, even that is not true in that case, even though he was definitely a genius. I mean, his father was a famous musician and he started learning music at the age of one or two, just started early and who knows, maybe in the womb, he heard all the music, right? So uh, those who believe that talents are innate gifts have a fixed mindset. Those who, with a growth mindset, they say they tend to achieve more. And that's what Carol found out because they, work harder and they know they can learn new skills. Then there's a concept of flow. And this is a concept which was introduced in 1990 by this American Hungarian psychologist. It's a kind of difficult name. It's pronounced as Mihai, cheek sent Mihai. Uh, I forget it. So I usually write it so I remember. So it's Mihai, cheek sent Mihai. Uh, and he said it's a mental state which when a person performing an activity at a peak level and is fully immersed with the feelings of involvement and enjoyment, all of us have been in that state if you are playing any kind of music or telling any kind of stories or any kind of hobby which you love, he really is there. But the good news is, and he has shown it, demonstrated in multiple studies, that flow is characterized by four Fs and it can be produced. And this is a simplified scheme by him. Actually, it's more complicated, but there is focus. One has to learn to focus. There has to be the second half of freedom from intervening thoughts. One has to learn to free oneself up and free oneself up from the inner critical voice, which usually is conscious and always is putting a, a sensor on one's own activities. One has to just, uh, you know, lose that and focus and try to get free of those intervening thoughts. A feedback in real time, which comes with a very clear objective that I am going from point A to B. And if I deviate, that means I'm not getting where I need to be in real time. And four, which is very interesting, he says that the, the challenge has to be a little bit more difficult, but not too difficult. So if you are learning chess, you know, playing with players who are 4% more expert than you are, you will learn and with time, yes, you will beat them. And then only to find someone who's again, better by 4%, but don't go to the chess master right up front because you'll get very demoralized and discouraged. So those are the four F that anyone can learn to produce a state of flow, which really is a major factor in creating peak function. Technology, I'll come back to this just a little bit later. Let me see if I have, no, I don't have it. The question is later on. So the technology is the new normal. So the three things are that, as I said earlier, the neuroplasticity and all the tactics based on those. 
there is this whole um, growth mindset and there is this flow and then the role of technology, which makes it very easy to leverage it in a most positive way to function at a much higher level. And how, what do I mean? Well, remote working, we are, most of us had to work remotely. Now, some of us are coming to work here and there, but remote working would be much more broadly accepted than it was before the pandemic, even when pandemic is no longer there. There's gonna be contact-free economy, which three areas most experts agree that it will be digital commerce, or, you know, Amazon's of the world, but it'll become much more sophisticated. Telemedicine for sure has become very popular. And then all the different services will be added to that and automation everywhere. Healthcare in itself will be impacted in major ways. Precision, wellness, and preventive medicine. Improved diagnosis based on data analytics. Better triage and care in healthcare system. Precision, personalized medicine, chronic care management. All of these will require AI applications, technology, data analytics. So technology is here we might learn how to use it to our advantage. So let me go to the question. Which of the following statements is correct? Number one, neurons that fire together, wire together. Number two, let's see here, okay. So we have, uh, so the first one is correct and we have intelligence, talents, or innate gifts, a uh, slightly higher percentage. Actually, that is not, Correct, because intelligence can be improved, even though, yes, there is a hereditary component to intelligence, there's no question about it, but it can be enhanced throughout life. Same thing for talents. And the other were a little bit more obvious, I guess. Okay, let's go to technology. Before I finish the presentation, I really wanted to remind everyone as much as we want to be technophiles and the new normal will be a whole lot of use of technology. It is absolutely essential for us to remember that technology, although optimally should give us information and I'm talking about digital technology and knowledge and hopefully with experience, some wisdom. Reality is it's the information overload and chaos, which is leading to a whole lot of stress and adding to our stress. And part of it is because we have now, just like the uh, obesity from eating too much, it's too much information. There's addictive behavior. We all know that. I don't have to explain this. This handheld, I mean, constant checking in the emails. It is amongst the most addictive thing. Your dopamine is released. Oh, saw the message. Oh, WhatsApp. And then, of course, the other social media, which I don't do too much, but my understanding is that teenagers are just basically glued to it which has given rise to problems of social isolation. People are sitting there, the families, you go to restaurants and the four, five, six people together and they are looking at their own phone. So they are alone together. So they're together alone, not talking to one another. And that's a problem. There is a issue of social isolation. There is of course, with anxiety, depression, stress, there's emotional volatility. So here's my question. Some questions actually to ponder for all of us. Would remote workers, as we get to new normal, be more productive or satisfied? I mean, right now, as I said, I think we need to use technology as much as we can, but I cannot close my eyes to some of the dangers. And I think there needs to be a dialogue. We need to come up with solutions and generally accepted principles whereby we use technology for the betterment of society, for peak functioning, but not make it our masters. How would COVID-19 pandemic impact social life long-term? Well, it's anyone's guess, but I think this needs to be discussed. We don't want to get used to alone together. Number three, how far can virtual connections replace physical connections? Talking to Zoom, we are here, we are all connecting. Can that replace completely any kind of social connection, attachment behavior? And finally, is it time for a human digital relationship reset. We absolutely, as I said, we do not want technology to be our master, but we want to have a peer collegial relationship like this. This is a human finger versus a technological finger. We really can work together. I have no doubt about it. And I'll be ending here. So the conclusions are in transition, 
COVID pandemic has worsened already existing stress in modern life. We all know that there's unfortunately epidemic of anxiety and depression, but our response determines the outcome, whether we want to focus on growth and resilience, look for the opportunity or get distressed and fall into dysfunction. But beyond resilience, the daily practice of exercise, and I shared mine with you, which really is sleep and enjoyable hobbies and balanced diet and walking exercise can definitely lead to higher function. And then beyond that, better acceptance of the latest finding in neuroplasticity. Yes, old dogs, dogs can learn new tricks and increased leveraging of technology should facilitate peak performance in many fields in the new norm. Thank you very much. I want to thank very special thanks to healthcare workers everywhere for their courage and commitment. They are really trying to protect us and by risking their own lives and health. To students, faculty and staff of Wild Cornell and in the community for being so resilient in dealing with the challenges of COVID-19 successfully. And for this presentation, very special thanks to Nikolai Adair, Renata Hayward and Amadisa for great help and preparation. I'm done and we'll be taking questions now. Thank you. I just wanna express my gratitude uh, to you, Dean Sheikh. This discussion was not only rewarding, but helpful in a variety of ways from, I'm sure each participant must have benefited. So we're grateful you. to you for your time. I know how busy you are for you to have taken the time out of your busy schedule to spend an hour and more than an hour and 15 minutes uh, we, are, we, are, we are grateful and we are very appreciative. I'm hoping that maybe in another six, four, seven months when the situation has changed, perhaps you will, you will agree to come back and talk about other emerging issues. Um, so once again, thank you so much on behalf of IPH and on behalf of the Dean's office. <laughs> we are so grateful to you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Dr. Mpani. As you know, this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. And hopefully, next time when I come in, I'll bring the next generation of Zoom. So we are all a little bit more closer to reality. How's that? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank and my thank personal you. gratitude to all the participants for having taken the time to be with us this afternoon and for asking questions. So shukran and thank you so, so much. Salam. Thank you.